is an eight iron and it's a dead shank. Wow. Way right. Oh, Take that shank. off the puzzle. You gotta be kidding me. Very tough pitch shot right here. You gotta hit it into the hill. One hop up and bite and it's in. Kind of like that. I would like to welcome to the podcast four-time PGA Tour winner, Bob Estes. Bob, thank you so much for taking the time today. Sure, looking forward to it, Jason. Well, you're coming off a really solid week at the Bowen Classic. Your game must be feeling pretty solid. Uh, anything you're working on right now, or is it sort of all systems go for the rest of the season? Um, no, it's definitely not all systems go. Um, I've been through a, a lot with my game the last year and a half in particular and definitely planning on um, working on some things um, with my <clears throat> setup, equipment, um, things like that for the next couple of weeks So before I go back out and play um, a stretch of three tournaments. So, yeah, my game has still been evolving. I've been making some changes that I probably should have made a long, long time ago that actually match up better with my body. And so um, I'm, I'm kind of committed to um, something in my setup with that and looking forward to working on it hard and playing better golf. So with the, the season you've had on the Champions Tour, we'll talk about that first, with nine starts and your 34th in the, the, the race on the Charles Schwab Cup, it's really solid. So as a follow-up to that, on the rest of the 2018 season, Will you be focusing on the Champions Tour, or will it be a combination of still playing some PGA Tour events and Champions Tour events? And then also, what's your 2019 at this point sort of looking at for uh, for next season? No, I'm pretty much transitioning to the Champions Tour now, but part of that, too, is because I didn't play nearly well enough on the regular tour when I still was playing on my major medical. I played the last event on my major medical at the Greenbrier about six or seven weeks ago, so... Um, I maybe wouldn't even, well, the Champions Tour schedule this fall is pretty full all the way up through the, the final event um, on the Charles Schwab Cup playoffs. I think there's maybe one tournament on the, the regular tour after that, and I'm not even sure if I would, would get in that or not based on my past champion status. So, so I'm pretty much just focused on the Champions Tour right now unless I do something special in a regular tour event that I possibly could play early next year, but I'm, I'm pretty much just playing on the champions tour now. So between the two tours, um, when I was looking at the stats this year, like I said, what you've done, the champions tour nine starts, super impressive. You didn't get the results on the PGA tour when you played this year. What do you think the difference was between, you know, the flip sides of that, of doing nine events to be where you're at and on the PJ tour and not getting everything out of it that I'm assuming you wanted to get out of it this season. Is it just too much pressure on yourself to try to perform at the highest level? Or is there a, a you know, one tour you're, it's unbelievably good in nine starts and the other tour you're not probably getting the expectation that you expect when you're out there? Well, I think the best way to answer that question is, is I hit the ball really well for the most part um, on both tours and just did not putt very well. I've really struggled with the putting this year, um, even on the Champions Tour. Now, obviously, I've shot some low scores, but I still haven't putted consistently well enough to finish higher than I have. So, um, no, I wasn't putting extra pressure on myself on the regular tour. I actually hit it better this year on the Champions Tour than I probably ever did at any point during my career, but I just was not making the putts, and there were different reasons for that. So, um, yeah, I obviously most weeks the golf courses are a little bit longer and set up just a little bit tougher on the regular tour, but the champions tour courses are legit as well. But, um, I think the scoring difference maybe two is because the, the par fives in particular aren't quite as long on the champions tour as they are on the regular tour. And so that gives you a few more easier birdie opportunities, you know, per round. And so that's, that's probably a little bit of the difference in the scoring where I was able to get it up around the green more often in two or knock it on the green in two and maybe, maybe two putt for birdie. Um, where, whereas I was, you know, like I said, struggling more with the putting on the, on the regular tour. 
what's the biggest difference besides the length of the golf course and let's say some of the pin positions are difficulty on playing both tours in your opinion what's the biggest difference is there uh is it atmosphere level of intensity is the champions tour a little bit more laid back at some level or is in your opinion what's sort of the biggest difference you're seeing from playing both tours when you're out there minus the difference of the golf course of length well i had a couple of different thoughts as you were asking that question let me see if i can get it all out but um like I said earlier, the um, the golf courses, for the most part, are a little bit longer on the, the regular tour, as you would imagine. But the setups really aren't that different. I mean, we're, I mean, as far as you know, where they put the pins and you know the speed of the greens, and we're still playing golf courses that have um, some rough on it. It's kind of like on the regular tour. So the main difference would be just a little bit in length, but um, but nothing else. Um, so you might have to ask that question again, so I can expound on that even more. <laughs> but yeah, is, I the, so many is, thoughts. is the atmosphere a little bit more relaxed on the Champions Tour versus the PGA Tour? Earlier in the week, for sure. I mean, the guys on the Champions Tour, and don't forget, it's different for every player. But there are certain players that are set for life on the Champions Tour. And there are other guys that are fighting, you know, week to week just to survive and, and to be able to continue to play on the Champions Tour. So it's it's more intense for some guys, you know, than it is for others. Um, but it's very competitive, and guys are are still working hard at their games. And the level of play on the Champions Tour um, would surprise and shock a lot of people. Um, some guys are playing probably as good or better than they played when they were playing on the regular tour. Now, some of that could have to do with there being no cut except for the majors on the champions tour, but some guys are just playing some of the best golf of their lives out there. Yeah. I had Scott McCarron on and he thinks he's playing as good as he ever has in his entire career in his fifties. He thinks his, his golf game is better than it ever has been. So, um, you know, I've, I've gotten that answer a lot of, and, and I know how good the guys are out there still, but how good the level of play in the Champions Tour still is. And, you know, go walk those golf courses and imagine shooting six under par every day for three rounds. It's it's legit. The The competition's really good from what I've seen out there. Oh, it is for sure. And don't forget, I mean, just in these last few weeks, we've had two 60s shot. Kenny right. Perry shot 60 uh, at the 3M. I think that was the second round. And Kevin Sutherland shot 60 last week at the Boeing in the second round. And, and those are legitimate golf courses. Those scores were crazy low. Yeah, it's uh, those guys can still play, that's for sure. Um, looking at your PGA Tour career, and let's assume it's not over at this point. You're going to play some more events a little bit here and there, so I don't want it to, to be that assumption. But with over $21 million in earnings, the four wins, and basically you've been exempt since 1988, what are you most proud about? Or what are you most proud of, I should say, of what you've accomplished on the PGA Tour? Oh, it's well, of course, I'm very proud of the wins because it's so hard to win on tour. But I think not necessarily even me, but some of the reaction that I get from other tour players that are younger than me, they're very impressed by, you know, how long I've been on tour because they know how difficult it is. So to basically, I had to go back to Q school a couple of times, but but still, I. I was able to play a full schedule or almost a full schedule every year until those couple of years when I was hurt. But for the most part, um, playing the PGA tour, unless you're just one of the very, very best players in the world for a long period of time, it's just about survival. And so I was able to survive out there, um, for, for 30 years. And so, yeah, I, I never really thought too much about it as I was going through the process, but when you look back on it and you, you also realize, how many players don't have a career anywhere near that long. That's something to be proud of. Yeah, I don't think the average golf fan, and I talked to Jerry Kelly about this too, of, of realizes, you know, you played 656 events, like how hard that is to be that good for that long, right? Just to be that competitive for that long, the commitment, the time. If I look back at your career, that's what I'm most impressed with on top of the wins is just to be that good for that long against that level of competition. It's actually pretty amazing. Yeah, it's, it takes a lot of um, hard work, a lot of self-discipline to be able to to have that kind of consistency over, you know, that many years. And so 
um, yeah, but, but that's kind of the way I was raised. I've always worked hard at it. It's what I always wanted to do. And so I just kept, kept working hard and kept trying to get better. So let's look at how you started playing the game of golf. Um, who introduced you to the game and how did you start playing and when did your talent really start to, to come out that there was some potential here? Uh, my dad started me when I was either three or, you know, just turned four or something like that. That's about the time we also moved from Graham, Texas, where I was born, to Abilene, Texas, where I grew up. Um, but, yeah, Dad had me, you know, playing all the sports. And I played football and baseball and basketball and ran a little track. And But um, after the sixth grade, um, I had to whittle it down to just um, – basketball and golf so i played basketball through high school as well but um i was playing junior tournaments when i was as young as five or six i believe um on a par three golf course that we had in abilene and so and we had so many you know golf was so big in abilene texas where i grew up um we had so many juniors playing so many supportive um you know parents and members at you know the clubs and other people at the municipal courses and the, the club pros and so uh, yeah it was just a great environment to to grow up in and yeah I was playing tournaments and winning tournaments from a very young age. Was your high school career pretty much a standout and then at what point did you know that UT was going to be the um, the spot you wanted to play your collegiate golf at? Yeah, my dad went to Texas, met a cousin that went to Texas, and we played our state high school tournament here in Austin every year, so I fell in love with Austin, and um, yeah, I pretty much knew that I always wanted to play at UT, but obviously I had to get good enough to to be able to um, have that opportunity, so um, yeah, I, um, yeah I, I, was, I was recruited by... Houston just a little bit and Oklahoma state pretty heavily. And so basically it came down between Texas and Oklahoma state. And I did take a recruiting trip to Oklahoma state, uh, cause I did want to go check it out, but, um, but it was a pretty easy decision for me to, to commit to um, playing golf and going to school at the university of Texas. Then when you're at UT, great college career, you win the Haskin award it has to be a tremendous honor and, you know, looking back at your college career, what point did you know that you were probably going to do this for a living or you were going to go pro? Oh, I knew I was going to do this when I was 10 or 11. <laughs> so I made, I made the decision early on. Uh, yeah, I was, I was definitely in love with golf from an early age. And so, yeah, I think I had even written a paper or two um, when I was in elementary school um, about my plans. And it definitely was to played off in college and then um, go straight to the PGA tour. And so, um, yeah. And, and like I said earlier, I, I, you know, won tournaments, had success all the way up through high school and college. But um, yeah, I, I worked awfully, awfully hard in college. I'm not even sure if I could, you know, do four years like that again, as, as, as hard as I worked in my game, as much time as I spent studying, um, to pursue a degree, even though I didn't quite finish, but um, but yeah, I I my plan was to go straight from college to the PGA Tour, and that's the way it worked out. Were there some of the guys on your team that ended up playing PGA Tour golf for an extended period as well? Were there some other guys that uh, that were out there with you once you sort of made it on tour from your days when you were at UT? Yeah, uh, I think Omar Uresti was the only player um, that had maybe an extended period of time on the PGA tour, obviously Omar has kind of gone back and forth between the, the PGA tour and the, the web.com over the years and you know, whatever other sponsors were prior to that. But um, most of the other players um, or, or team members, teammates that I had um, a number of them played mini tour golf, um, but but there wasn't too much success there. So they all kind of moved on into other careers. So I'm pretty sure that Omar was probably the only one that, um, had other, um, you know, PJ tour experience, I guess you could say. Yeah, and he's still out there in the, uh, playing in the club pro championship, beating out by the younger guys every now and then he's, he still has some game, obviously. Uh, yeah, no, Omar's a, he's a really good player and, I don't think anybody loves golf more than Omar does. So, 
so yeah, he's still working hard at his game, and um, you know, he played a few PGA Tour events this year, and he's obviously played in some of the um, national PGA Club Pro tournaments and sectional events, and just he just loves to play golf and compete. So when you go pro, what was the pathway for you to the PGA Tour? Did you do any mini tours, or was it pretty much Q school, then you got your way through it, or how did that process go for you to get yourself onto the PGA Tour? Um, after the NCAA championships in 1988, I played one more amateur tournament. I played the Texas State Amateur at Lock and Bar in Houston, and I won that. But I knew that I was going to be turning pro the very next you know, day or week or whatever. And so um, my first professional event was the Bogey Hills Invitational, which was the largest uh, mini tour event in the country at the time. And that a $200,000 purse and $40,000 was first prize. And so I entered that and ended up winning it by one shot when I buried the last hole. So that's how my professional career got started. So I got off to a really, really good start, but I was only able to do that because I had an uncle and another good friend of his that were um, committed to sponsoring me from the very beginning. And so, but I played well enough playing, um, that tournament, state opens, a handful of PGA Tour events, and then I did make it through the qualifying process the very first time. So I think they only needed to sponsor me for about a year before I was able to financially do it all by myself. But um, it helps to have financial backers. Um, It's hard to do it without financial backing in the very beginning. And then when you get out there on the PGA Tour with that UT connection, who were some of your mentors? Was Mr. Crenshaw and Mr. Kite, um, did they serve that role as, as sort of a Sherpa or a guide for you when you got out there? Or who was sort of your mentors or guys you looked up to when you first got out on tour and learning your way to be a professional? Um, yeah, I guess Tom Kite is the first one. Well, no, the first one I should mention is Charles Cootie. I grew up in um, Abilene, like I mentioned, and I worked for Charles Cootie at Fairway Oaks Golf and Racquet Club um, in the bag ring and picking up the range. I can't remember, you know, how long I did that, but I did it for, you know, quite an extended period of time to give me access to be able to practice there and play the golf course. And so I was also able at times to go play with um, Charles Cootie and his son, Kyle, uh, who was also one of my teammates in junior high, high school and college. Um, And then we had so many other really good players um, growing up there as well. But um, but Charles Cootie probably, I guess you could say, maybe would have been the first tour player, uh, you know, who I would have been looking up to and learning from. And then after I turned um, professional, um, I was represented by an agency that also represented Tom Kite. And so they arranged for me to, uh, and I had met Tom before and, and Ben Crenshaw, of course, but anyway, had a sit down meeting with, um, with Tom Kite. And we talked about a lot of things. I can't remember exactly what all was said. The one thing that I did always remember was Tom saying that um, it takes money to make money. So I guess he was, you know, talking about, um, you know, not cutting corners or, or whatever, you know, there's a lot of different things that that could mean, but I understood what he was talking about. And so, um, yeah. And and then there were a lot of other players, um, of different generations because obviously the, the, the PGA tour has players playing from, you know, in their teens to in their fifties. And so, yeah, there were just, so many, so many great guys to, to, um, you know, kind of model your game or your, um, demeanor, personality, whatever after, um, I could just go on and on and on. There's just, you know, there's, there's been so many, so many great guys, um, you know, that played the PGA tour that have been so nice to me and so helpful, um, especially in the very beginning. Yeah, I would, when I was out at Exmoor for the Player Senior Championship, I got to walk nine holes with Mr. Kite and his caddy and just spend some time with him and pick his brain and, you know, ask him how he goes about his process learning the golf course. What a gentleman. It was one of the most enjoyable afternoons I've ever had on the golf course of just spend a little bit of time with him. He couldn't have been more kind and 
you know, nicer to somebody. He didn't need to spend time with me, and he did. Complete gentleman. It was a fantastic day. So I could see how he could be a great mentor to somebody. So you're playing the PGA Tour, and you're out there a few years, and you get your first win at the Texas Open. That had to be extremely special to be a Texan and to knock that first one out in the home state. Um, yeah, it was. Um, you know, of course, I just wanted to win anywhere on the PGA Tour, but to win the one closest to where I lived here in Austin and obviously being called the Texas Open, yeah, that was really special. So I did have some friends and family there, and I was able to share it with them. And so, um, yeah, that was, that, that was really special. And then with the three other wins, you know, to be a multiple winner on the PGA Tour kind of, you know, puts you in a different stratosphere of where the players are at sort of on the totem pole, and you've done it three other times. Of those three other wins, is there one that really stands out or looking back is is one a little bit sweeter than the other one of maybe the way you performed down the stretch or anything like that or any of them? Um, they're all great, right? They're wins on the PGA Tour, but does any of them stand out a little bit more than the others? Yeah, probably the one in Memphis, not just because it was my second win, and that was a long time between wins one and two, but I had become really good friends with a lot of people in Memphis. I've been telling you know, people for a long time that that's kind of like my third home. You know, I was raised in Abilene. I live in Austin and went to UT, but um, got lots of really good friends that that live in Memphis. And so, because I was, uh, I was staying with a family, the Martin family, from the time I first played there in um, the summer of 1988 when I got one of those five sponsors invites. And so, um, they had been so supportive of me and, you know, I'd even gone back at times in the winter time to, to go and visit them. And so developed close relationships with a lot of the, um, the families there. And so to be able to have so many of them come out and watch me play every year, whether I was, you know, playing good or not. And then to, to you know, to finally win that tournament, um, that was pretty incredible. You've played in all of the major championships on the regular tour. Was there a major that you enjoyed playing the most? And what was it about the major that, that you know, basically was different than the other ones or you got up for it the most or the one that looking forward to each year and out, like that was the one that you really, really loved playing in? I guess for me, it's probably a tie between the Masters and the Open Championship. Um, everybody knows how... Um, incredible and special the masters is and the beauty of the golf course but almost on the other end of the spectrum um is the open championship and i qualified for my first one in 1990 when i went over and made it through the qualifier there for st andrews um i i still remember when i was very young making sure that my mom or dad woke me up in time so that I could watch the, the open as soon as it came on television. Um, you know, sometimes that was, you know, maybe five or six o'clock, but I just, you know, fell in love with the open championship and always dreamed of playing in it. And then to go over there and qualify in 1990, um, not just for the championship, but for St. Andrews, um, yeah, that was that was a dream come true for sure. But um, every Open Championship that I've played in, I've I've loved for the most part. Well, except for maybe the one at Carnoustie where they um, fertilized the rough and <laughs> let it get out of hand. But um, but yeah, the, the, those two tournaments, uh, those two majors, are are my favorites for sure. And also, kind of looking back at your career, and this question is going to be a little bit long winded, but. You know, I'm assuming when you started off on tour, you were playing a wooden wood or at least a small little metal wood with a ball that really spun and it curved. And how have you had to change your golf game as the equipment change, you know, really kind of came about during your career? And even in the, you know, really since, you know, in 2003 when the Pro V came out and the 983 driver with that combination really kind of changed it. How how have you had, well, have you had to adjust anything in your, in your swing in your game to sort of coincide with where the technology was going and where it currently is? 
Now, this is probably the most interesting thing that we can talk about on your podcast. And I was actually um, talking with um, somebody either yesterday or the day before about how much the game changed while I was just coming into my own in 1994. In 1994, and yes, backing up just a little bit, yeah, no, obviously I grew up playing wooden woods and a lot of balls and, you know, blade irons and bullseye putter. So, yeah, the game has changed tremendously, um, you know, since, you know, the, the mid-90s in particular. In 1994, I was number one in the all-around statistical category. However many categories they had, you know, 10 or 11 or whatever it was, they'd add up the rankings and then you'd have an overall ranking. Well, I was number one overall at the end of the year. And that's also the year that I won my first tournament, like you mentioned earlier, the Texas Open in San Antonio. In 1995, that's pretty much when the titanium drivers made their appearance on tour. And the, the first titanium drivers that came out on tour were quite a bit more upright and they had closed faces, not just the drivers, but the fairway woods as well. And I was a fader. So other guys were having a lot of success with titanium drivers and, and hitting it further. And so everybody kind of felt like they needed to, to play one to be able to, you know, keep up or catch up or whatever. But all of a sudden, I couldn't hit the fade that I was playing with either a wooden wood or a small steel-headed driver. I was actually playing a Bridgestone Jays driver um, those couple of years prior to the Titanium showing up on tour. So most of those clubs were anti-slice clubs. So the equipment manufacturers, and they say it was based off computer models, but basically they were um, clubs designed to not let the ball go to the right because that's what most anglers struggle with. And so, so we were pretty much trying to, to play equipment that um, didn't suit tour players. And so by 1996, I think it was, I guess I survived 1995, but by 1996, I was heading back to Q school. So here I was just coming into my own, uh, no, playing some of the best golf of my life in 93 and 94. And by 96, I was heading back to Q school because I couldn't hit my fade in the fairway. And at times I did go back to playing uh, a wooden driver, or maybe the smaller steel head. But um, anyway, it was a, it was a real frustrating time. I think there were a number of players that used to be great drivers of the golf ball and some of the best players on tour. And I think that um, the equipment change, shorten their careers some of the guys that come to mind quickly uh, you know were chip beck jim gallagher jr um you know I, I don't know exactly don't know exactly what those guys were going through with their games at the time but some of those guys were playing great golf and then their um, careers were over in a hurry so um it was a real frustrating time and now the titanium drivers um in particular, since we're just talking about the drivers right now, you know, are adjustable. So you can make them sit pretty much however you want to. So now, and it has been for you know, a number of years now, the, the drivers are maybe designed the way I thought they should have been way back in, in the mid-90s. But it took them a long time to kind of transition from us playing clubs that were designed more for amateurs to clubs that were designed for tour players. So... And, I, and I'm old enough where I remember all this stuff. I actually remember that Jay's driver, and that thing sat way old. I mean, yeah, it was designed for the professional golfer. If I remember the Ozaki brothers, um, you know, I could see how that thing could fade. So but the, so let's say Callaway or whatnot is coming out with a titanium drive in the mid-'90s. Even for the guys on tour, they did not have a pro or tour version that they made for you guys that they'd open up the face a degree or two. You guys were back then stuck with the same thing they were selling to everybody else. Yeah, they were just mass-produced, and we were they were – they were having us play same and it wasn't just Callaway, but Callaway, I guess was kind of the leader in the beginning. And then, um, uh, players were having some players were having success and then other companies that started to, to do their own titanium drivers and fairway woods. Um, I remember those pretty much looking and sitting just like 
the the Callaway clubs and you know the, no matter which company it was and so lots of lots of players struggled i remember playing with um jay haas at the masters who always drove the ball so straight with a nice little draw and and he was he would hit one left one right maybe time one right hit it in the fairway then hit another one way right another one way left because they just didn't they didn't sit the way that they were supposed to for a good player uh, they were just too upright and too close, and so you had to almost hold the face open just the right amount on the way down, and that's not the way to play golf, especially under pressure. Has your golf swing changed as well for, let's call it the modern equipment, when the drivers got to 420, 440, 460 cc, and you could gain that ben- benefit out of it with the ball not spinning as much? Did you actually have to make changes in your golf swing as well to accommodate for the equipment? Well, I probably should have. And one thing that I did notice that I should have done earlier is over the years, I've noticed more and more players coming out on tour with stronger grips. So, you know, I learned to play the game back in the 70s, and my two original golf teachers were Ben Hogan disciples, um, who obviously was just down the road a couple of hours in Fort Worth. And so I was always taught to try to eliminate one side of the golf course, just the way Ben Hogan did and talked about. And, and so that was the left side. So I played with a, um, a very weak grip and never had to worry about a hook. You know, I, I might hit a pull occasionally, but, um, but anyway, when the, when the titanium heads came out and the drivers got longer um, it made more sense to play well, and, and also with the golf ball not spinning as much, it made more sense to play with a stronger grip because it was hard to get the face back to square on a driver that was, you know, 45 inches long. So more and more players showed up on tour with stronger grips, and they were driving it long and straight. And so, so golf changed quite a bit, you know, especially you know, right around that time, 2000, when uh, the Pro V1 came out. Do you think the golf ball is too out of control at the pro level at this point? Would you like to see more workability and curvature to the ball than what currently happens? Um, I think it would make the game um, a little more interesting, and you could almost say a little bit more fair to, to to the medium hitters. Um, I think I've seen something before. I can't, I don't really have the stats. I don't know where to, or the numbers. I don't know where to send you to look for it or anything like that. But I'm pretty sure that it's, it's been proven that once you are able to get your club head speed up to a certain miles per hour, you benefit more from the current golf ball than you do if you're under, you know, say a specific um, club head speed, uh, producing a a certain ball speed off the face. So, um, yeah, and and obviously you've you've heard and read plenty about golf courses having to, um, you know, add tee boxes, remove bunkers and things like that. So, um, you know, and in a longer golf courses, for the most part, are going to make for longer rounds. And so that's one of the things I, you know, talk about. I mean, I remember back, um, and I'm not saying a lot of technology hasn't made the game a lot more fun and a lot better for a lot of people and all of that. But um, I just kind of remember back when a round of golf took three hours, not, you know, five or six. And so golf is, changed in a lot of ways for the better but but not in every way would you be okay with a biification of the rules where us amateurs have a certain segment and then you guys have to play at a different level or do you think golf should be under one set of rules and we all play by them oh i I don't know you probably would rather me have a stronger opinion on that i know but you know i kind of read a lot of opinions coming from both sides and I don't know what the what the real answer is on that. Of course, you'd, you'd, you'd like it to, to be the same, but the game is so different at the highest level compared to um, what most average golfers are able to do that, um, you know, maybe 
you know, maybe there should be some bifurcation, but I, I, I really don't know. I'm, I haven't um, thought about it maybe quite as much as I should have before your podcast. And then I'm thinking about like the average guy with an 85 mile an hour club head speed. If they brought that ball back, I mean, they'd barely be able to drive the ball 200 yards with a. You know, I, I could see people just revolting if they, you know, if, it, if they took their Pro V or their Srixon XV away from them right at the at the amateur level. I think it it'd be detrimental to the as hard as golf is for most people i think it would be i don't know if they'd be able to do it at this point if they for the amateur golfers that they'd be able to pull it back without having serious consequences of people's enjoyment out of it i know it's an interesting argument right i could also flip around the other side and say it's played under one set of rules for this many years and that's the way golf is so it's an interesting argument or a debate to have on the situation yeah i mean it sure is i mean would you rather um you know hit the ball you know 10 or 20 yards further and play in, you know, five hours, or would you rather give up that distance and, you know, maybe save an hour per round? I don't know. Maybe it just depends on who you are. Yeah. It's, it's going to come to a head at some point where they're going to kind of go one way or the other on the, in the major governing bodies. It's, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with it. Um, the other follow-up I have from your career is as long as you've been out there is, working out and what you do physically. So when you first came on tour, did you even work out? Were you supposed to work out in the eighties like that? Or was it considered quote unquote bad for golf? And then how has that transition gone to what you're doing, you know, from a workout standpoint at this point to keep yourself competitive at, you know, into your fifties? Well, I did have to alter my workouts about, um, 12 years ago, uh, because I was actually working out, too hard and i was i was lifting too heavy um mainly upper body um i mean obviously i'm 52 now um so as you get older your training probably should change somewhat um but i um i wasn't hitting the ball as well as i knew i needed to and i wasn't sure if it was because my golf swing wasn't good enough which it wasn't uh, or if my training was holding me back because I had gotten too big through the, the chest and the shoulders. And so as it turns out, it was, it was both of those things. Um, once I was able to kind of lean out some and lose some of that mass in my chest and shoulders, you know, then I knew that my golf swing wasn't um, what it needed to be either. Um, so, so yeah, but no, I, I've been, I mean, I, I grew up playing all the sports, like I mentioned, and I mean, I was, I was, we were working out, you know, in junior high. Um, and so, so I've, I've always worked out. So there are plenty of people that maybe didn't play other sports and all they did was play golf and never worked out, but I've always worked out and never stopped. And, um, when I was in college, um, um, our golf team worked with the strength coaches there, um, or at least at least the ones that, that wanted to. Um, so I've always trained, and I've got a great trainer now that I've had for at least 20 years, Scott Hennig, who was a world-class pole vaulter. Um, and you know, we were just working out yesterday, and we'll be back in the gym today and every day this week. But, yeah, it's um, not, it, I, there's so much I can say about that because, the, the training that a golfer does can benefit his game or it can also be detrimental to his game. You better just have a really good trainer or be getting, um, you know, really good information from, you know, whatever source. Um, but you need to make sure that it's benefiting your golf and not detrimental to your golf. So now you're sort of focusing on a little more lighter weight more explosive movements, more higher reps. I'm assuming a lot more core strength than just purely lifting anymore at this stage of your career. Well, no, I was doing all the other stuff as well. I just specifically had to back off the upper body lifting because I was I trying you. to lift. I was trying to lift too heavy. No, I've always had a very balanced training program, um, and I was trying to get bigger and stronger. And I'm actually probably in the off season going to kind of go in the opposite direction just a little bit, and because I probably could go ahead and and gain a little bit more upper body strength for the most part during the year, we're just trying to maintain 
and usually in the off season when I've got um, more time to just train, that's usually when I was trying to make more gains. But um, yeah, I, I um, but I've always um, done all of that: the cardiovascular, of course, stability, mobility, power, strength, all of that. Well, let's talk about Austin Country Club. Uh, what a rich history. And uh, that member member must be tough to win. Now they got Sergio down there as a member as well. So have you gotten to know him a little bit? And um, ACC has to be a great spot to keep your golf game sharp. It's uh, from watching the coverage when they have the event on television. It looks like a wonderful golf course. Um, oh, it is. Um, now the member member you're talking about, that was the Austin golf club. It is easy to get those two confused. Oh, that was not at Austin. Uh, but, okay, my, yeah, my but, fault on that. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, you're not the first one that um, thought that uh, they won the, the member member at Austin Country Club. That was the Austin Golf Club. That is Ben's um, baby out um, west of town. It's about 25 minutes from here at Austin Country Club, but, um, but it's a great course as well. Uh, I, I, Sergio, I know, either has access to Austin Country Club or they might have given him honorary membership of sorts. I can't remember exactly, but, um, yeah, Austin Country Club is a great club. I can't believe I didn't join sooner than I did. I think I joined in the sometime in the mid to late nineties, but I should have, I should have joined, you know, just as soon as I had a chance, but, um, didn't really, you know, I guess when you, when you have access as a tour player to play just about anywhere you want to, you, sometimes don't even think about joining a club because you can go anywhere you want for the most part. But, um, but I joined Austin country club in mid to late nineties and never regretted it. It's a great place, great course, so many great people, such a family club. And it's such an incredible setting also on Lake Austin. And you also have a really good caddy on the bag. Uh, Chuck Moore, when I'm, out there on the couple events I go to a year, which is around Chicago, and I always like talking to Chuck. He's just fantastic. Um, how did you start working with Chuck, and what does he bring to the team that you most admire about him? Probably the best thing about Chuck is how, um, I guess, level-headed he is and how consistent he is with what he does. Um, he doesn't he doesn't get too excited, no matter the circumstances, doesn't get down doesn't get upset with me if i'm not playing well or whatever but you know he's always on time he he does his homework and he's just very very consistent you know every day every week in in what he does and how many years you guys work together at this point chuck started working for me in the spring of 2001 and that was probably about a month or month and a half i think before my second win my first one with him, which was the tournament in Memphis, but I had different caddies up to, to that point in the, the spring of 2001. And so I, I had a couple of different caddies caddy for me, kind of like tryouts. And Chuck was the one that I decided to go with. And we've been together ever since. It's a great story. Well, I've got just a few more here for you and I'll, uh, I'll let you out. These are just sort of quick fires and whatever comes to your mind. Let me know what you think. So best three or four golf courses in the world architecturally and what makes those courses so great? Well, a few of them I probably haven't even played and I hope to someday. <laughs> um, I mean, obviously Augusta national is, is one of my favorites, just like St. Andrews, which we talked about earlier. Um, there've been a number of other open championship golf courses that I've really enjoyed playing like Muirfield and turn dairy and Troon and, Litham and Burkdale, you know, most of the ones on the open um, championship rotation. Um, I still haven't played Royal Melbourne. People speak so highly of that, and I've seen it on television, and maybe someday I'll get to play that one. Um, you know, Cypress Point, we used to play that on tour a long, long time ago, so I played that one a few times. Great golf course, great setting. Uh, Riviera has always been one of my favorites on the tour. Um, those few years that I was hurt and couldn't play it, it was killing me, um, to not, not get to. And so, um, yeah, I'm sure there's so many more, so many more courses that are so well designed and so much 
fun to play. I haven't played Pine Valley. I've had a couple of opportunities to go play there, but you know, the, the, the time either didn't work out or I was maybe injured at the time. So two or three of the most interesting people you've gotten to meet because of the game of golf and not necessarily golfers, just from what you do for a living and what that gets you access to. Hmm. Oh, I maybe should have had, had this ready to go for you, but, um, mm. well, I can't, that, you know, we got to keep it spontaneous, <laughs> right? Um, well, I obviously we get to meet a lot of, um, people that are very successful, um, in their careers, you know, whether it's in the sports world or, or outside of it, but, um, Oh, well, just some of the names that that come to mind quickly are some of my AT and T partners, like um, Kenny G. Um, got paired with him. I was working with the same teacher for a while that Kenny was working with, and so got to, to play with Kenny. But you know, he's an incredible musician, obviously, and known all over the world. Um, Josh Dumel was a, a partner of mine um, one year, and so we stayed in touch. And he's had all kinds of success um, as an actor. And a super guy too. Um, oh gosh, I'm just trying to think. I played with um, maybe my very first AT and T tournament. Uh, I, I should have been able to remember the name, but it's escaping me. But he was a very famous actor, and I know that it was. Um, it's very impressive for my mom <laughs> that, that I was that I was able to to play with him, get to know him. Um, I believe his last uh, his last name might have been Keeler, um, one of the other famous actors, and I believe seven brides or seven women. Um, and then obviously there's so many other, you know, people that have, you know, heads of corporations or you know, people that have been very successful in the business world. But yeah, you know, I'm kind of drawing a little bit of a blank now. That's all right. Well, if, if uh, one pops in your head, I got just a couple more here, and you can throw it out there. Um, best golf shot you ever hit under pressure, and what were the circumstances? Well, I, there's a number of shots that come to mind. Um, I mentioned that Bogey Hills Invitational Tournament as you know my first professional event. Um, I I think I was can't remember if I knew that I was top of the lead at the time. I don't think I was in the very last group, but on the very last hole, I hit my tee shot left and it was a tree lined course for the most part. I was in the trees. There's a very difficult green as well. Very difficult to putt. And I believe it had two tiers to it, but I was in the left trees. I probably did know that I needed to make bird in the last hole. And there was a small gap in the trees that I had to hit the ball through and, and hit a cut shot. And I believe it was an eight iron. So I, I hit the shot just like I, I had to through the small window or gap in the, in the tree branches, ended up four feet from the hole and, and made the putt and ended up winning the tournament by one. So so that one certainly stands out. But then my first tour win um, in San Antonio, the last hole is a par three, nine and 18 are both par threes at the clubhouse. But um, I had a one shot lead on Dr. Gil Morgan and I was hitting a five iron in and the green, you know, it was not that big and a couple of bunkers around it. And I hit five iron pretty much into the center of the green and Dr. Gill at the green as well. Um, he missed his putt, and then I rolled mine up there and close and tapped it in for par for the one-shot win. So so I, I guess those were probably two of the best because they were my first two wins, my first two win, my first win as a professional and my first win on tour. The most raw, talented golfer you ever got to play with in your PGA Tour career where you were just blown away of how naturally gifted they were at the game of golf? Well, I guess you'd still have to say Tyra Woods. I mean, obviously he's worked very, very hard at it, but, um, but there's just, you can just tell the way he did it. I mean, he was so, so much more naturally gifted than anybody else, but you can't take advantage of that unless you work as hard as he did also. So I'd have to go with Tiger. Any great stories in his heyday where you guys won at it head-to-head, or is there any great Tiger stories you had um, 
when he was in that stretch from, say, 2000 to 2008 or so, where you played with them or won at it and great competition or great match or anything like that? Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's pretty easy to, to keep up the number of times that you've played with somebody like Tiger or Jack Nicklaus or Arnold Palmer or whatever. But I think I'm almost positive I played seven rounds on tour with Tiger. And I believe that I scored lower than him three of those seven times. I think one year at the tour championship, might have been 99 at champions in Houston. I think par was 71, I believe. I think Tiger shot 68 and I shot 65. So, so that was pretty awesome. Um, you know, that wasn't his best golf yet. His best golf started to come around in 2000, but still, he was still Tiger Woods and, you know, to, to, to play with him and, you know, beating three shots in one round. That was a lot of fun. It's good stuff. Uh, last one I got for you. If you could invite uh, three other touring pros, it doesn't matter if they're from the Champions Tour, regular t- you know, regular tour, um, either one of them, and you're going to go out to your club at Austin Country Club and play a fun money game and have dinner afterwards, what three guys are you bringing? What do you admire or enjoy most about being around those, those buddies of yours? Oh, is that... Um past or present living deceased uh, living guys um, like you can call up tomorrow and do a <laughs> do a oh. great game with <laughs> okay oh and that's such a hard one to answer too i mean there's like i tell people there's just so many great guys on the champions tour and the regular tour um oh you just i, I just you know I, I i hear that question asked a lot and um you know i think about it and it's always hard for me to kind of come up with with the names because there's just so many so many great guys um but well that's that's a good problem to have that they enjoy the guys that much out there right yeah yeah so um if, if you if you want and need some names right now um oh let me let me go ahead and um i'll take um kite and Crenshaw here in Austin and um and I'll I'll take one of my all time favorites, um, Kenny Perry. He's just such a joy to be around. He's always so nice and having so much fun. So um I'll go with that group. Pretty good group right there. Bob, thank for the time that you gave us to do the podcast. I greatly appreciate it, and uh, good luck for the uh, upcoming Schwab Cup. Keep playing well, and um, um, like I said, thanks thanks for the uh, opportunity to get to talk to you today. Oh, I enjoyed it. Thanks, Jason.